I invite you to pray with me. Your gracious and loving God, as we read the words of Scripture, as we hear a parable used by your son Jesus to teach us about your kingdom, we pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit to inspire our reading and our hearing. May it come alive in these moments. We ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. This parable is from the Gospel of Matthew. It is you know, one of you know, Jesus' parables of the kingdom. Those parables have a way of, I believe, you know, troubling us, you know, making us think, you know, causing us to look deeper within ourselves. Jesus said, For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned up, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, and to each according to his ability. And he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I've made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had the one with two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See? I made two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. You know, then the one who had received the one talent also came forward and saying, Master, I know you are a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. And here you have what is yours. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew. Did you not that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers so on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him. Give it to the one who has ten talents. For all those who have, more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for the worthless slave... Throw them into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Are you comfortable with that parable I just read? I'm not. You know, is that what you want to hear from Jesus? Throw them into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not me. The one who received one talent kept it safely until his master returned. And then what happens for keeping it safely, giving it all back to him, he is punished. It seems to me to be grossly unfair. And it should not surprise us that the early Christian church had some trouble with this. And so they came up with a different version. It didn't make the scriptures, however but they had a different version. It's found in the Gospel of the Nazarenes, one of the apocryphal Gospels. And in that version, there's a fourth servant, one who received one talent also, and he went out and he wasted the money on parties and good times. And he was the one who was punished. Now that seems to me to be a little fairer and a little more to our liking, except for one thing. It was not the original parable. And it was not the parable that Jesus told. 
Now, what did Jesus say in this story? This difficult parable I just read to you. Well, first of all, it is a story about money. In fact, most of you know, Jesus' teachings were about money or healing. Second, it gives us a two different views of reality. We have a view of reality on the one hand of abundance, and then one of scarcity. Last, it exhorts his followers to trust the abundance with which they have been blessed. So let's look at it. The story, as I mentioned, is a story about money, and it's a lot of money. This is a story about a lot of money. You see, a talent, one talent, was worth 15 years of a laborer's wage. It was between 60 and 100 pounds of silver and gold. Now today, that would be worth more than one half million dollars. Jesus was not talking about a paltry sum. He, his parable was about three people who received from their master a great deal of wealth. More than they would ever use, more than they had ever seen, more than they would ever need. And it's also the story about three individuals who had, I think, very good motivations. I cannot, you know, remember last Sunday I talked about motivation. I cannot impugn the motivations of any of these. They wanted to do the right thing. They wanted to please their master. What would you do if you were one of these three? What would you do if you were to receive $500,000 or even more? I think it's an awesome responsibility. You know, today we usually refer to the talents of the parable as, you know, God-given gifts, like the ability to sing, play an instrument, to teach, you know, to run, dance, or jump. Literally, a talent. You know? But the parable of the talents, at least as I understand it here, and as I translated the Greek for myself, makes more sense this way because we're supposed to, you know, we think we're supposed to use our talents to the glory of God, you know, our ability to sing, our ability to do these things. But this parable is not about the talents as we know them, our God-given abilities. It's not about the talents and the gifts that we have been born with, no. It's about possessions. It's about money. And it's about a lot of possessions, a lot of money. You know, the two who received the five and the two talents, what did they do? They went out and they invested the money that they received. It was not their money. It was their master's money. But they went out nonetheless and they invested it. Invested it. Between you and me, that's risky. That's risky. You know, today we would talk about fiduciary responsibility and all those kinds of things. Risky. Can you imagine opening a brokerage account for a couple of million dollars that isn't your money and you are you know, responsible and accountable for it? Would you put it in the commodities market? You know, the stock market. What if you made the wrong choices? Think about it. What if you lost some of it? Would your master punish you? Would you be deemed irresponsible? It's very interesting. The first two slaves did not respond to those fears. This is what's amazing. They went ahead. They invested the funds. The third, who received one talent, $500,000 in our day and age, responded to his fears. He was afraid of his master. You know, he knew his master was a demanding person. He knew that he was also a stern person, not above punishing those who displeased him. And so the thought of losing those funds literally scared him to death. I bet you he stood about it for a while, you know, looking at this gift, $500,000. What am I supposed to do with it? I bet you he, he looked at it for a couple of weeks, finally said, look, I've got to make sure that I get it all back to him. So what does he do? He goes, digs a hole, puts it in the ground, marks it, maybe has a secret marking, and then, you know, at least I'll return all of it to him. Finally, he says to himself, better safe than sorry. Better safe than sorry. Buries it in the ground. 
He played it safe, did he not? He played it safe. He would not lose anything. And he thought that his master would be pleased because he could account for every penny. But we know this was not the case. And his master was not pleased. I think, though, you know, as we look at this story and we deal with you know, you know, the problems you know, that it causes for us, the way it challenges our values, we need to see the story within the context of the entire gospel of Jesus Christ. Because by itself, I believe this story is a very bothersome story. And it doesn't make much sense to us. But when we see it within the larger context of the gospel, I think it begins to make a great deal of sense about the way Christ wants us to live in a world where we have possessions, where we deal with money every day. Do you remember the story of the loaves and the fishes, often referred to as the story of the feeding of the 5,000? Think about that story for just a second. What if you were the one who had those two fish and a dozen loaves? What if you were the one who possessed those you know, items? Would you try and conserve them? Would you say, well, so this is for me and for my family. Now, if we have any left over, then we'll share it. But this is ours. But that didn't happen. You know, and this is the miracle of that story. That small amount was shared by all, and it fed all. I think that example from the gospel and the parable of the talents describe two different ways of looking at the world and all that we have in the world. The one view is scarcity, and the other view is abundance. The slave who received one talent operated from a scarcity worldview, and thus he wanted to play it safe. The others that you know, the others had a view that celebrated the abundance that they received. And like this parable, the story of the loaves and the fishes is also a story of abundance. When the people who were out there only felt scarcity, Jesus looked at those two fish, those dozen loaves, and said, we have enough. This is abundance. In the movie, came out about 15 years ago, The Pianist. Great movie. But in the movie The Pianist, there is a scene where a Jewish family, I believe it's in Austria, is in an internment camp, and they're about to be sent to a concentration camp. There, you know, they are there with so little, each with one little bag that was all that they could have. The father has the family gathered around in a circle, and he reaches into his pocket and produces a caramel, one caramel candy. He pulls out a pocket knife and proceeds to cut that single caramel candy into six pieces and shares it with the members of his family. This was a situation, as I watched that movie, where one could feel overpowered by feelings of fear and scarcity, and certainly that was there. And yet, in the midst of this scarcity, we witness one who sees the world and even one single caramel candy in terms of abundance and shares what he has. One caramel for six people, abundantly shared. Now, what's the cause of our attitudes of scarcity? You know, the scientists tell us that it's part of our DNA. Isn't that wonderful that we can blame things on our DNA these days? You know, it's what enables us to live through and survive famines and other situations. But these same scientists tell us that it's also the cause of a number of destructive impulses, including overeating, miserly, hoarding, and antisocial behavior. And at the root of these behaviors are feelings of scarcity and fear for the future. The third slave plays it safe. He plays it safe with his money, his master's money. Why? Because he's afraid. He played it safe. 
And Jesus' judgment is a condemnation of fear. You know, fear is a powerful motivator. You know, fear, I believe, is the negation of the goodness of the gospel. You know, the gospel that begins with an angel talking to a pregnant teenager named Mary. And what does he say to her? Do not be afraid. An angel who speaks to shepherds, quaking in their boots, wondering if the sky is literally falling upon them. And what does the angel say to them? Do not be afraid. Jesus, who speaks to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, saying, consider the birds of the air. They, don't, they do not fear. They're not anxious about tomorrow. Live like them. I think fear compels us to play it safe. And the danger of our fears is that we never enjoy the rich abundance with which God has blessed us. And we never truly feel thankful hearts. As I was reading this, I asked the question of myself, do I play it safe? Yeah. Sometimes I do. And so the question is for you also, do you play it safe? Do we as a congregation play it safe? What is our attitude toward money, toward possessions, toward what we have received? How do we perceive this world? Is it a world that we see filled with abundance, or is it threatening with scarcity? You know, in two weeks, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving. You know, one of the symbols of Thanksgiving is the cornucopia, you know, a horn of plenty, you know, overflowing with fruits, vegetables, and all the good things of the harvest, symbolizing all that we have received from God and the thanks we offer to God. Indeed, symbolizing the abundance of God's creation. Are we willing to celebrate our abundance and to share it? Or are we afraid that we won't have enough? And so we protect what we have and we bury it in the earth. I sometimes fear that we Christians often live with a scarcity worldview. We're constantly worried about what we don't have, what we need, and whether we have enough. I see it in churches after 40 and a half years. I've seen that as a destructive impulse in almost every church I've served. Quite frankly, when we operate from that viewpoint, we miss the joy, the joy of all that we have received from God. I think that this is a parable. It's about money. It's about possessions. It's about how we invest that which God has endowed us with. You know, throughout the Gospels, Jesus characterizes our possessions and our money as a force. You know, even in one parable, he refers to it as mammon, a god. He gives it a name. You know, that makes us nervous. It's a force that makes us nervous. It causes us anxiety. It contributes to anger and arguments. In couples, in organizations, in nations, and even churches, most conflicts involve money and possessions in some ways. I know, my wife and I argue about it. It's real. It is a powerful force. The parable of the talents is not about how much we have. It's not. It's about how we perceive what we have and how we use it. Now, Jesus, seeing the pain and anxiety that, his, that had caused his followers, offered a different worldview and a radically different sense of accountability. Now, we may feel or even say, better safe than sorry. But this parable's message is this. Safe is sorry. Enjoy, share, and use the abundance with which you have been blessed to enrich the lives of others and to celebrate the joy and the glory of God. This is good news. Amen.